uh, who was a postdoc with me, Chen Chen Mu, who was also a postdoc, and uh, Jan Zanga is uh, a professor at uh, USC, which is uh, another university in uh, Los Angeles. So, so next, please. My talk will consist uh, of two parts. Next. The first part will be more on a storytelling style, and uh, it will last about uh, half of the time, a little bit less than half of the time. It has an advantage, which is that uh, it will be accessible to everybody, even non-mathematician. It has the disadvantage that uh, at first I will not uh, give any definition or state uh, theorem. And the second part will be more rigorous. It will last about uh, 25 minutes. So this rigorous part uh, has also an advantage. I will make a precise statement. The disadvantage is uh, a knowledge of uh, analysis is uh, required. Uh, when I invoke a thing like uh, a Brownian motion, uh, a white noise, uh, I will not do that uh, often. So if you are not familiar with uh, what Brownian motion are, you don't uh, worry, this will not prevent you understanding the talk. So when I write uh, MFG, which I will do a couple of times, I will mean uh, mean field game. So here is a setting of a problem. We assume that we have a group of players. Player is a general terminology which may mean a different thing. Uh, for instance, uh, if I take uh, a system of uh, particle, I will call each particle players. If I take uh, the population of a country, uh, a population which is co competing, to get something, uh, I will call them a player. If I take a group of customers interested in trading specific goods, I'll call them a player. So player can be human being, but player also can be a physical system where particles are in motion and uh, are evolving according to a certain rule. Mathematically, we represent uh, each play, player by position, which is an element of uh, RD. Then we'll start a set of rules which the player are going to react to. An example, people may decide to consume less uh, meat if you raise the price of uh, meat. If you rate the price of uh, gas, uh, people may decide to carpool more often. So someone has uh, a power at some position to make decision and uh, expecting that uh, everybody react to that decision. Mathematically, the rules are given by a Lagrangian. So here I am going to work with uh, some specific Lagrangian this is not going to cover most of the real life uh, problem because uh, we don't know how to work with a uh, very general Lagrangian. We are going to work with uh, some particular one. In uh, the evolution of your problem, you need to make some uh, postulates. The postulate I am going to make uh, I could look at the mod models where the behavior of the player is uh, deterministic. I can also look at a model where the player have uh, independent stochastic uh, behavior, which means that uh, the way player one is behaving stochastically, player two doesn't know what player one is doing and uh, it will behave independently in uh, its own stochastic way. I can also add to the model a common noise. A common noise is uh, the stochastic behavior of uh, an institution, for instance. This institution is going to impose a common rule to 
everybody. And the decision of the institution will have some deterministic part, but it may also have uh, some uh, stochastic part. And uh, we are going to refer to that to common noise. Mathematically, part 2i means each player is assigned with an independent Brownian motion, and we call that independent noise. Part 3 means every one of the player is assigned with the same Brownian motion. And this statement, at some point, we are going to convert them into partial differential equations. So here is a conjecture made by uh, Roberta Omen. He was uh, a Nobel Prize winner. He made the conjecture in the 60s. And uh, this is uh, a very good pre pre prediction, which is uh, un unbelievable. And uh, only now we know how to prove this conjecture. We know how to prove part of this conjecture how to make it rigorous, and uh, we understand now better why he was making certain assumptions when making that conjecture. So what he said, he said that uh, it is paradoxical that uh, we look at a deterministic game with finitely many players, and uh, we are looking for Nash equilibria. Nash equilibria should not exist in general but should not exist in general. There is a, a specific model I am going to present. And in that specific model, which has to do with uh, fluid mechanics, Nash equilibrium should not exist unless you put some stochastic in uh, the game. So consider a game where you have uh, N player. The players are identified by their position, Q1 for player 1 up to Qn for player n. I am going to record the distribution of the player in mat one mathematical object. It will be the measure mu, which is the average of uh, n Dirac masses. Each Dirac mass uh, is concentrated at uh, the point where the player is. So delta Q is a function which acts on sets. When you compute the delta Q of a set A, you get a 1 if a Q is in A, and you get 0 if Q is not in A. So delta Q tells you if uh, the player is present in a region or not. So if you take this specific measure and you compute the measure of uh, a single point, you see that uh, the measure is zero, except uh, if one of the point is QI, in which case the measure of uh, QI is uh, one over N, if I am assuming that uh, all the QI are distant. We say that uh, QI is an atom for the measure. Alternatively, instead of uh, recording the distribution of a player in a measure, I can start with uh, a probability space, omega p. Omega p can be quite general. So you can take uh, omega to be the interval 0, 1, for instance, and take p to be the one-dimensional Lebesgue measure. Then you take a partition of uh, omega, you partition that into set of uh, equal measure, 1 over n. And uh, you can define a map, which is uh, a combination of the characteristic function of the omega i. So the characteristic function of omega i, when you apply to a point x, it takes the value 0 if x is uh, not in omega i, the value 1 if s is in omega i. So I said you can take any omega i very general, but you have to choose your, your omega. 
such that whenever you are given n, you can always write a partition of uh, equal measure. So, if you compare the measure mu, which is uh, in uh, i, and the map, which is in 3i, there is a relation between them. If you take any set B, subset B of RD, and you compute the measure of B with respect to mu, or you compute the measure of the pre-image of B with respect to P, you get the same thing. So this is a mass conservation condition. X is defined from omega to RD. If you measure a region in omega and you measure the, uh, using the measure P and you measure the region in RD using the measure mu, you get the same thing. This means that uh, there is uh, no mass loss when you leave uh, the target uh, space, the original space to the target space. We say that uh, S push, pushes a P forward to mu, and uh, this is the notation we use for <laughs> S pushes P forward to mu. This is a standard notation in uh, probability theory. So I may also want to represent uh, a population of uh, player where the player don't have uh, the same weight. But for instance, I may have a uh, five player. One player has uh, a very bigger weight, which is a uh, 0 0.95, 96. And all the other player has weight, uh, which is a uh, 0 0.01. But even more generally, I can uh, represent uh, a player by an arbitrary measure not only finitely many players, infinitely many players. So you may wonder if uh, it, in real life, life uh, it makes sense to talk about uh, infinitely many players. This is just an asymptotic limit where you have a system with a large number of players, and uh, to understand the system, you let the number of players go to infinity. You study the limiting uh, equation, and uh, you want to know if you can make inference on the original equation from the limiting equation. This is something we do a lot in fluid mechanics. Pour, pour some uh, water in a glass. Then in your glass of water, do you have a finitely many particles or uncountably many particles? In fact, you have finitely many particles, but uh, we treat fluid as uh, if uh, they consist of uh, uh, uncountably many particles. And this, in fact, uh, turned out to give uh, us uh, a good way to study evolution of fluid. So this is the same thing I will be doing here using general measures. So we say that uh, the measure has no atoms. If uh, whenever you measure a single point, you get uh, zero. So I didn't mean uh, mu of s is greater than zero. I mean to write that uh, mu of s equal to zero. So uh, what is written there is uh, wrong. Strictly greater than zero should be replaced by equal to zero. So when you look at the population evolving over time, assume at each time at t you represent a the distribution of the population by a probability measure mu t. You say that the game is non-atomic if uh, at uh, each time uh, t, mu t has uh, no atoms, which means uh, if you apply mu t to a single point, you get zero. This is a way of insisting that uh, no player, a single player cannot have uh, uh, an influence on uh, the system. For instance, uh, if you are going to compare that to what happened in real life, take the election of uh, a, co a country, presidential election in a country. 
one player doesn't make a, a difference. I, I think if you look in memory, you will not find a situation where the candidate have all the same number of vote, vote except one candidate has more vote than the other one. So realistically, one single player doesn't make a difference on the outcome of the vote. Once you finish the vote, if one person decides to change his mind, it is very unlikely it is going to change who the winner is. The conjecture which uh, Omen made is uh, under appropriate condition on the evolution rule, game with uh, no atoms have Nash equilibrium. I have not defined what a Nash equilibrium is, and I am going to do that, that uh, later when we come to the rigorous part of the talk. But uh, roughly speaking, a Nash equilibrium is a stability condition. A Nash equilibrium is a situation where uh, all the players choose a strategy. One of them decides to become a dissident, not to follow the strategy of uh, everybody. If this player do with that, then uh, he or she is going to pay a higher cost. So Nash equilibrium are much more difficult than uh, looking for minimizer. Looking for minimizer, you, you do a global search. You don't care about what everyone do. But in Nash equilibrium, when someone changes his decision, it is going to affect everybody's decision. So it is more a fixed point problem than a minimization problem. So as done before, we are going to sometime represent a population by a map. And the natural question is, uh, can we always relate a measure to a map? This is, uh, there is an old result in probability theory, which says, uh, yes, if you take a rich enough probability space, so you take a space uh, which has no atoms, every probability measure on on uh, mu on RD for any probability measure, you can find a map X, which is from omega to RD, such that S pushes uh, the probability measure forward to mu. And this means what I wrote uh, at the bottom. For every B subset of RD, you have uh, the mass preservation condition as before. Now, when I am given a map, a map S from omega to RD, it is likely that I have another map Y from omega to RD, such that the push forward of X, P by X, is the same as the push forward of P by Y. Therefore, I am going to define a class of equivalence. The class of equivalence of S will be all the map Y, which has the same push forward as S. So you may be wondering why instead of working with a measure mu, I am working with a map X, and then eventually I am going to the class of equivalence because from the class of equivalence, you see that it is saying S push forward P to mu equal to white push forward p to mu. So given mu, I associate a class of equivalence to it. So you may wonder why not work directly with mu? Why work with uh, S and its class of equivalence? The short answer here, which I am going to make it uh, more clear later is, uh, when you look at the set of map from omega to RD, Assume that the expectation, the square of the expectation is finite. This is a Hilbert space. A Hilbert space is a flat space. On a flat space, you have a, a very trivial geometry. You understand what the geodesic are. When you are on the set of probability measure, 
This is a curve of space. The geodesic are more difficult to understand. However, if you can view the set of probability measure as the quotient space of a Hilbert space, then you may put a differential structure on the set of probability measure, which is the quotient st structure on uh, the Hilbert space. So we know well how to define a quotient structure. We know how to recover geodesic on the quotient space uh, going from geodesic uh, on the big space. However, all of this uh, statement I am making still need to be made uh, rigorous, but this is your intuition, the intuition which guides guide you, telling you uh, when you are doing, uh, when you are choosing to work with a uh, uh, map instead, uh, you have something in mind, you have a gain which uh, you are going to get later. So in summary, I am going to represent uh, a population either by a measure or by a class of equivalence of map. Here is the state of the art in a mean field game. A Lagrangian is a function which depends on X, the position of one player, mu, the distribution of every player, and the V, the velocity of the player who is at X. You say that the Lagrangian is separable if it can be written as uh, the sum of uh, L tilde, which depend only on S and V, and F, which depend on X and mu. So X, V are the space and velocity variable, and mu is uh, the distribution of the whole group of players. So there is a condition which has been introduced by uh, Lassery and Lyon, Minfield game was invented by two groups. One group is in the mathematical community. These are Lassery and Lyon. And the other group uh, is uh, in uh, the engineering community. You have uh, Juan Malhami and um, a third person whose name I am forgetting. So you say that F is monotone if uh, whenever you apply F to mu2 and you apply F to mu1, you make the difference. You multiply by mu2 minus mu1, you integrate, you get something which is non-negative. So a real value function is monotone if uh, when you divide F of mu2 minus F of mu1 divided by mu2 minus mu1, you get something non-negative. But uh, here, you cannot divide by mu2 minus mu1. Not that uh, f of mu2 minus f of mu1 divided by mu2 minus mu1 is greater than or equal to zero if and only if this product is greater than or equal to zero. This product making sense in a, a more general context, uh, this is what uh, is used as a monotonicity condition. So in, uh, 19, uh, in, in 2019, Cardia Lague, De La Rue, La Suy, and Lyon, they uh, prove a result uh, which uh, is uh, rather serve as uh, an authority in the field. This is uh, one of uh, the most important results. They say, assume that you have a separable Lagrangian as above and assume that uh, in the discomposition, the F which appear is a strictly monotone. So strictly monotone means you replace a greater than or equal to zero by strictly greater than zero when F1 is not a F2. Assume we are given a monotone terminal value function. So the, ter the terminal value function means at a time capital T, we have a value function which uh, measure the cost of the population. This will be a function which depends on X and mu. 
assume that value function is uh, monotone. And uh, assume we are talking with a game where we have uh, individual noise. Maybe we don't have common noise, maybe we have common noise, but we cannot do without uh, individual noise. Then uh, the mean field game master equation has uh, a solution, a unique solution in global time. I have not stated what the master equation is, so you can ignore result A and uh, focus on result B. Result B said uh, there is uh, a unique uh, Nash equilibrium. So there is something called the master equation. Once you know that you can solve the master equation, there is a specific way for using the master equation to construct uh, the Nash equilibrium. So this result, which was proved in, uh, 19, in 2019, uh, Leon has announced it uh, over 10 years ago. And uh, it was uh, believed in the Minfield game community that uh, in presence of uh, individual noise, this condition, monotonicity condition of uh, Lassery and Leon is uh, necessary to have a uh, uh, well posedness. So well posedness means uh, existence and uniqueness. And I am talking about a global in time uh, well posedness, not short time uh, well uh, short term well posedness. So this is just uh, repeating what uh, I I said. So when the Lagrangian is uh, not separable, the study of global well posedness of uh, mean field game was not uh, accessible. And uh, we are going to later explain uh, uh, why this was uh, true. Our main contribution with uh, Mezaros, Mu, and uh, Zang is uh, we discover a new condition which we term a displacement monotonicity condition. So displacement monotonicity condition, uh, I can give a precise statement, but uh, it will be more difficult for you to remember what it is. Therefore, I am going just to give a sufficient condition for displacement monotonicity to hold. It says that if you take any map X, Y, S prime, Y prime, and uh, you put them in the Lagrangian. So the first argument is uh, X plus uh, epsilon plus delta Y. The third argument, which plays the role of velocity is uh, S prime plus epsilon delta, epsilon plus delta Y prime. And in the middle, you keep just uh, x plus epsilon y. So you take the displacement, you take the position s, you write a perturbation with, with a y, which will serve as a, here as a, a velocity, and you push forward p. You differentiate this twice with respect to delta and epsilon. You should get something which is non-negative. So our actual definition of uh, displacement convexity does not require this inequality to hold for every x, y, s prime, and y prime. It requires the inequality hold to hold for every s and y. And then you take, a, you write s prime in terms of s, and you write a y prime in terms of uh, y. In fact, uh, s prime must be equal to x, but at some point, uh, you worry about the fact about what happened to X when you are on RZ and you go, you are on a bounded ball, which means 
the player go to infinity. And you want to cut off a x and get a s prime. So you can you can view x as s prime, but uh, rigorously s is a uh, s prime after you cut off a s prime at uh, infinity. And uh, we have an explicit expression for y prime. So if you write the above condition for every s prime and y prime, you have displacement convexity, but you don't need to impose this inequality hold for every s prime and y prime. The theorem by myself, uh, Mezares, Mu, and Zhang is of the following. We make the assumption that uh, assume L is a displacement monotone and a negative G, the terminal value function, is a displacement monotone. So here, I am not uh, assuming that uh, L is uh, separable, and so I don't need uh, to impose the separability condition, which was uh, necessary in uh, the theory of uh, Lassery and Leon. Our conclusion is uh, the master equation is uh, globally well posed in time. So for a large time, you have uh, existence and uniqueness of solution. And uh, as a consequence, you can conclude that uh, there is a unique Nash equilibrium. So one may wonder if uh, we are working with a smaller class than Lassery and Leon. The answer is uh, no. The first, uh, the, the first uh, argument is uh, we are not assuming that uh, our L uh, is a separable. And so it cannot be a subclass of Lassery and Leon. Second, call DM the set of uh, displacement monotone Lagrangian and call uh, LL the set of uh, uh, Lassery Leon monotone Lagrangian. We have that uh, DM is not a subset of uh, LL and uh, LM is not a subset of DM. So here is a specific example. Take a F to be given by an interaction potential. So I am going to define F of uh, SQ to be phi convolution mu applied to X. Then one can show that uh, displacement monotonicity is equivalent to phi is a uh, convex. And one can show that uh, last three Lyon monotonicity is equivalent to the Fourier transform of phi is uh, convex. You can convince yourself that uh, there is no relation between convexity of a function and the Fourier transform. For instance, if you take phi to be x minus y, the norm of s minus y squared, this is a convex function. If you compute the Fourier transform, the Fourier transform is strictly concave. Therefore, x minus y, the norm square, is a displacement convex. Negative x minus y, the norm square, is a lastly Lyon monotone. In summary, this result by uh, the two groups uh, don't uh, uh, are parallel to each other. They are not contained. One is not contained in the other one. So starting from uh, here, uh, this is uh, no longer a storytelling style. I am going to introduce uh, some uh, definition and uh, make more precise uh, uh, statement. If you are not uh, an analyst, you can still understand, uh, I will say, uh, a good part of, of that. But uh, maybe at some point, for safety reason, I recommend you fasten your seat belt because uh, this will be for security reasons. So I am going to face uh, a non-atomic probability measure space. 
All I need uh, is uh, the, the space of omega p is not important, but all I need is uh, the space should be rich enough to support uh, infinitely many independent uh, Brownian motion. For instance, the set of curves from uh, zero capital T to RD is a such a probability space. So a group of uh, distinguishable player is represented by a map from uh, omega to RD. So the set of all player, distinguished player, is the Hilbert space L2 of omega RD with the measure P. If you start, you try to study a trajectory on this infinite dimensional Hilbert space, this will be a too difficult problem. Therefore, you can rather consider group of uh, undistinguishable player. Say that uh, the player undistinguishable mean you replace uh, the map S by the class of equivalence of X. So here is an example. Assume you have uh, uh, Jean and, and Jacques, a player. Jean is uh, at one corner. Jack is at the other corner. And both of them switch places. Then according to the game, the distribution is still the same. So when you take up a distribution of a player and you apply a permutation to it, you still get, you still view data as the same distribution. And so this is what uh, the difference is between a map S and the class of equivalence of uh, map. A class of equivalence of map is uh, you apply, you look at a measure preserving map from omega to omega, and you write the composition with X. What you get, you say that this is still equivalent to X. One check the following. If you call uh, mu, the push forward of p by x, which uh, the probability, probabilities call uh, mu the law of x. If you compute uh, the Hilbert norm of x, you get that it is the second moment of uh, mu. So the second moment is the last uh, mathematical integral on in, in uh, that line. So you see that uh, working in a Hilbert space, which is equivalent to the expectation of the absolute value of S squared is finite, is equivalent to working uh, with a probability measure with a finite second moment. So we are going to denote the set of probability measure on RD with finite second moment by P2 of uh, RD. And uh, S push forward the P, the, which is the law of S, sometimes we are going to write a calligraph L subscript X. So one check, we, when we have a quotient space, we know how to define a, a metric going from a space to quotient space, we know how to define a metric. You compute the distance between A and B where A is in the class of equivalence of S, B is in the class of equivalence of Y, and you minimize over A and B. One check that uh, the quotient metric is uh, the vast distance between uh, the law of S and the law of Y. Some of you may know what the vast distance is. Some of you may not know. If you don't know what the vast distance is, take this as a definition. If you know what it is, Take this as a theorem. So what is above says that uh, there is an isometry between the quotient space and uh, the set of probability measure with a uh, finite second moment. So this isometry is uh, good news 
we are going to hope that uh, this isometry will translate into differential structure. There is a differential structure which is defined by on the set of probability measure by Ambrosio, Gigli, and Savary. And it will turn out that uh, this differential structure coincides uh, with the Hilbert space structure I am going to describe here. But uh, this needs to be proven. So one advantage to work with uh, the Hilbert space is uh, the geodesic are very simple to describe. They are straight lines. But uh, still, uh, to make all of these uh, useful, there are some rigorous results we need to prove. So the next theorem is a contribution to the statement that uh, the differential structure on the set of probability measure coincide with the quotient uh, differential structure. This result was proven by uh, myself and uh, Tudorescu. Assume that uh, you have a U hat defined on the Hilbert space, and assume that you have a U defined on the probability space, and assume that U hat and U are related by the fact that U half of X is U of the law of X. So if you look at the set of probability measure as a, as a quotient space, you interpret the U hat as a lift of U from the quotient space to the whole space. <clears throat> Our theorem is uh, U is differentiable at S naught if and U hat is differentiable at S naught if and only if uh, U is differentiable at the law of S naught. This is a necessary and sufficient condition. Furthermore, if you take the gradient of uh, you, the Hilbert gradient of you at S naught, you can factorize it. It is uh, the composition of a map and S naught. It turned out that uh, this map is uniquely determined. It is not an accident. This map uh, is uh, the grade, the Wasserstein gradient of you at mu naught. So here you have two ways to go. Either you know the optimal transport theory, and this is, uh, you, are, you are saying uh, uh, the gradient which is defined in optimal transport theory is what appears in this factorization. If you don't know the optimal transport theory, what appears in the factorization, you can decide to make that uh, the definition of your gradient. And so the old theory and uh, this uh, presentation are consistent. This theorem is uh, highly misused uh, in the literature. It is stronger than the result of Pierre-Louis Lyon. Pierre-Louis Lyon require you had to be continuous differentiable in a neighborhood of S0. This means that the Pierre-Louis Lyon cannot define a gradient at a point unless you have continuous differentiability in the neighborhood of that point. This factorization proof, uh, uh, in the case of Pierre-Louis Lyon, this is a one-page proof. If you give off continuous differentiability, and if you want uh, differentiability as a specific point, then uh, that becomes uh, a much uh, longer proof. You will find many people, uh, especially in the minfield gamer community, who don't uh, understand the subtlety because uh, they are still quoting the wrong results. So I am going to assume that I am given a Lagrangian as before, except that uh, now I am not going to assume that uh, it is uh, separable. It will depend on uh, the first argument will be S, the position of a single player. The second will be mu, the distribution of all players. The last will be V, the velocity of uh, a single player. We are going to define the Hamiltonian. This is almost the Legend transform, but uh, for convenience, 
instead of having a P, we have negative uh, P. This is not a big deal. It is convenient just for notation. We are also going to assume we are giving a value function. The value function uh, depends on uh, two variables, S and mu. So it is given the cost for the player at position X when the distribution of the whole population is uh, mu. So take a trajectory which represents uh, the trajectory of a player. So a player is at a certain position at time capital T. This is a terminal uh, position. And then the player is going to move over time using the trajectory gamma. Call X the trajectory, the collective trajectory of all players. Then when you take the pair gamma S, you are going to associate to it a cos, which is the integral of the Lagrangian L. The first argument is gamma T, which is the position of the player at time T. The second argument is the distribution of the whole group of players at time T. And the last argument is uh, the velocity of uh, the same player at time T. And you add to it the value, the cost, the terminal cost of uh, the, this specific player at time T when uh, you know the distribution of all the other player. When I got right gamma subscript T, I don't mean derivative respect to T. It is very convenient uh, to write uh, gamma subscript T instead of gamma T. And I will do the same for XT. So assume all players choose a position. They choose their tra trajectory over time. And one of the players decide that uh, he is going to change uh, his mind. Then if the player, that player changes its trajectory, the collective trajectory will be different. And this is what I just wrote. S uh, gamma Q is telling you that uh, everybody else uh, keep uh, the same trajectory, except uh, one player keep take a different trajectory, which is uh, gamma. Now we want to define uh, what a Nash equilibrium is. Take a terminal position, initial uh, position for all the player, call it a Z, and take a trajectory X. And you ask yourself, uh, is uh, this trajectory a Nash equilibrium, knowing that uh, the initial position at uh, uh, time zero is a Z. For the answer to be yes, you look at the last inequality. The last inequality says, uh, if the, all the player keep their position, including player Q, the cost to player Q is smaller than if uh, player Q change its position and choose gamma. So when player Q change its position and choose gamma, the new collective position are S gamma Q, which I take into account in the right-hand side. And the left-hand side is uh, the cost of the player if uh, he does nothing, and the right is the cost uh, if he does uh, something different. So this is just repeating what uh, I said. Now I would like to have uh, a stochastic description. Uh, take a d-dimensional Brownian motion. A common noise uh, is a noise uh, where there is a uh, a single institution, for instance, the United Nations. The United Nations can take, make a decision 
hope because of the decision they want to push for a certain behavior people to behave a certain way so they make decision hoping that people are going to uh react to that for instance if they de discreet decrease the the uh, fee when you go from uh, one border to another border in uh, within the state in the united nation this is supposedly going to encourage trade between a uh, uh, country in a uh, in uh, that uh, in of the african union if they increase the fee this is going to discourage the stochastic what makes it stochastic uh, is uh, you look at these uh, five points you see that these five points are moving in a random way but the random is coherent all the randomness are exactly the same they are translation of one to the other in a common noise differential equation if you call zit the position of player i you add to the equation you add the noise beta naught and you add the same beta naught for every i take infinitely many other brandon motion which are independent of b naught in an individual noise description you take the equation for player i when you write zi you see that what appears in the equation is a white noise which is independent for each player so the the noise for player i is different from the noise for player j Therefore, when you have an independent and common noise, it means that uh, you have uh, a coefficient in front of uh, bi, and you have uh, another coefficient which is the same in front of uh, b naught for all players. Mm -hmm. Briefly, just to let you know, um, you have a few minutes left. Okay. So when we impose that the beta is uh, greater than zero, we are always impose that beta and alpha are greater than zero and deterministic gain mean alpha epsilon beta equal to epsilon equal to zero. So maybe move to the next. Move to the next. Okay, no, please go back. Okay, look at the last. Uh, equation the last expression the last expression gives you a partial laplacian so you take the hessian of a function and uh, you compute the tracer with respect to a finite dimensional basis so if i was going to compute uh, the laplacian itself i am going to take the trace with uh, an orthonormal basis, which will consist of infinitely many vectors. So here I am taking a partial trace. Next. So what I wrote on Hilbert space, you can translate that to uh, the set of probability measure. We'll go to next. We compute explicitly the partial Laplacian, and uh, this is uh, what uh, you get. And we discover that uh, if you compute explicitly the, lap the partial Laplacian, you get uh, the common noise. What appear in the minfield game literature are the last uh, three lines. And so what I am claiming, I am claiming that uh, the last three lines, which appear as a uh, common noise operator in minfield game has a geometric meaning. It is a partial Laplacian. The first uh, two expressions which appear in that partial Laplacian, if you call them O, this is what appear in a minfield game as a, in the individual noise operator.
as I said, the common noise operator has a geometrical meaning. We don't know a meaning for the individual noise operator. You can go to the next page. So the master equation consists in solving the following problem. You differentiate you with respect to time. You add the epsilon one, the common noise, epsilon two, the individual noise. You add the Hamiltonian, which I forgot to, to do, and you say that uh, this is equal to that miss derivative. Our main result is uh, under displacement monotonicity, we have a uh, global wet poles nest for the master equation. The closing question remark is, uh, the master equation is known to be an infinite dimensional conservation law. I have a specific statement about that. If you go to my web page, I gave some lecture in Berkeley. If you look my lecture note in Berkeley on Linfield game, I gave up a specific argument why the master equation is an infinite dimension of conservation law. We see now that there are two theories to prove a global well poseness for that infinite dimensional conservation law. In finite dimensional conservation law, there is one theory. One could wonder, is it a true that in finite dimensional conservation law, maybe there is another theory for global workforceness? And that would be the end of my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, thanks a lot, yeah. <laughs> I will clap on behalf of everybody. Thank you very much, Wilfried. Um, okay, so I will leave up the, the slides for a moment um, in case there are any questions. So if you have any question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask Wilfried directly. Or you can also uh, just post in the chat and then I will pass on the questions to Wilfried. So are there any questions? Uh, yes, can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I wanted to know if these uh, PDEs are used to actually compute Nash equilibrium for some of the games in economics and how it's actually done numerically. Do you have any suggestions on these approaches? Yes. So once you find the U, the gradient of U with respect to S will be your optimal control. And with your optimal control, this will give you exactly your Nash equilibrium. So the answer is uh, once you solve the master equation, you, you have explicit the Nash equilibrium. Now, <clears throat> like what is done in uh, numerical analysis, when you want to understand, uh, when you want to understand uh, a, a discrete system, if you know smoothness property of the limiting system, it can tell you, if you know convergence uh, uh, rate, uh, it can tell you something about the discrete system. And so the main field gamma, uh, the master equation will give you an approximate solution to the uh, game with finitely many players. And uh, this is a theorem, one, one can show that. Thank you. So, there any other questions? Um, yes. Let's go ahead. Can I? Okay. So, thank you, Wilfred, for this very interesting talk. Um, I actually, this is very interesting for me because I work with Minfield Games, and it's the first time that I see a talk on this paper that I saw on archive, like maybe a trimester ago. So, thank you again for this opportunity. My question is, um, um, on, at some point you define an infinite collection of Brownian motion. And I wonder if it's, not, if, if it's always possible to define it on, your, on this enlarged probability space. Is there a specific result on which you, on which you 
you that you use to make sure that you can actually define this infinitely many independent Poynian motion? Yeah, so the answer is uh, if you take an arbitrary probability measure, uh, probability space, you will not be able to, you may not be to find the infinitely many independent Brownian motion. Mm -hmm. So you have to take your probability space to be big enough in some sense. This is why I said that your space has to be rich enough. And one example is that if you take the set of curve from the interval 0t to rd, for instance, you can put a measure on that, a probability measure on that. And uh, in this case, uh, you can get infinitely many Brownian motion. If you take your probability space to have finitely many points, for instance, of course, you cannot get uh, even uh, one Brownian motion. Mm, thank you. Um, if, if I have other questions, but if anybody else wants to jump in. OK. So, um, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, hello, Prof. Prof. Gango. Uh, I, will, I have a question on um, the measure you define. Is there any particular reason to define that uh, the measure new in that way? No, so the, the measure mu is a uh, is uh, a variable which which uh, describes the distribution of, of player. Um, so so the the unquestionable natural uh, description of uh, a game of player is to use a map. Measure I use because you want to have an, a description where the player are not distinguishable. And uh, when you do that, this is a lot of gain of compactness. A Hilbert space has no compactness property. If you caution the Hilbert space by a certain relation, you get the set of measure. And the set of measure come to you with uh, a tremendous gain of uh, compactness. So this is why we use uh, measures. OK, thank you. Um, and I think uh, Rin Fock had another question. Yes. Um, so, um, uh, yeah. Okay, yes. So my question was about differentiability of the measures. At some point, there is you are differentiating and you, you got a factorization result. Yes. And is it like, um, I, I did not get the code because the way I, I understand the derivative by Lyons, which often in the which in the textbooks is co often called L derivative, is yes. that to be able to factorize, you need this extra regularity. Yes. But you seem to be saying that actually this factorization can happen without the extra regularity. So can you like um, share the reference where that result is? Because I am sure discovering it. So if you go to my web page, my okay. latest paper with uh, Tudorescu. So in the theorem, the name which is written Tudorescu. Okay. My, my most recent paper with Tudorescu give you the, that result, that uh, point-wise uh, differentiability implied factorization. So to elaborate a little bit on, on this, yes, the, the Hilbert gradient is uh, defined from omega to to Rd, right? Because a gradient is an element of the Hilbert space. So it yes. is different from omega to Rd. Mm -hmm. Psi, the Wasserstein gradient is different from Rd to Rd. Rd. Yes. And this factorization tells you that there is a change of variable. Mm -hmm. when, mm -hmm. when, you, when you write a Psi composition S, this is like a change of variable, which allow you to link a function on Rd from R defined on RD to a function defined on omega. Thank you. Um, the other question that I had was in, still in the differentiability. You write this, this um, Laplacian with respect to omega. Um, like, is it the, okay, yeah, please. Yes, when you define this, Laplacian yes. with respect to omega. Yes. Um, if I wanted the Laplacian with respect to the whole measure, because it appears that here, if I read correctly, 
it is the Laplacian, but in a not in all the in not in it's a finite dimensional approximation of the measure Laplacian. So yeah. will this will this Laplacian be still defined when the when I want the whole the Laplacian in the whole measure space or yes. So just first for the notation, this omega is uh, meant to be W2. I, I meant to write the Wasserstein Laplacian. So ah. the subscript omega. Now coming back to your, your question. If you take uh, a basis EI, I from one to infinity, if yes. you write this sum, it will divert, it will not co converge, right? Because uh, for the infinite sum to converge, you need uh, the expression EI, EI, you need that to go to zero. Mm -hmm. But if you have an orthonormal basis, uh, it is unlikely this goes to zero. So searching for a Laplacian on the Hilbert space, uh, there will be no Laplacian on the Hilbert space. You can put a weight right in, in front of the in front of the EI EI. I can put a coefficient uh, AI such that uh, when I let uh, if instead of adding a d term, I go to infinity, this converge. But once you do that, you lose a symmetric property, which means that uh, you have some preferential direction. The first vector will have a bigger weight than the second vector. The second vector will have a bigger weight than the third vector, and so on. And this is no longer a Laplacian. So this uh, partial Laplacian, it is uh, just a Laplacian where you restrict yourself uh, to the finite dimensional of space spanned by uh, E1 to ED. Okay. Thank you. Um, so again, I had one last question, maybe if it, there's still some time let's, or not. Let's see if there's somebody else who has a question, and if not, we'll get back to you. Yes. Um, are there any other comments or questions? Yeah, can I ask a question? All right. Yes, go ahead. So right at the end of the talk, you mentioned that this master equation could be viewed as a cons infinite conservation law. Yes. I was wondering, I'm not a specialist in the area, whether there's an accompanying Noether invariance theorem. Uh, does this conservation law come with some invariance on the distribution space? So in, in conservation law, you have a uh, in finite dimensional conservation law, you have a, a you have a um, path of measure, and at each time you have a probability measure. Yes, so there are some uh, conserve quantity. I see. Which, uh, because uh, be, because when you look at the evolution of all players, this is uh, the, at each time you have a probability measure, which means that at each time the total mass is conserved. Got it. Is there a geometric intuition for it? I mean, can you think of the right-hand side as an operator um, and then basically ask of how many yeah, degrees of freedom, how many conservation laws are there? I mean, there's conservation of mass, right? Yes, there is conservation of total mass. So the right hand side is uh, is uh, a directional derivative, right? Because you see, I have a I have a gradient, the Wasserstein gradient of u, in a product with a gradient x. So this is uh, uh, a directional derivative. What you do, in fact, in reality, if I move a dt u to the right hand side, if I choose a uh, some specific path uh, mu, uh, the sum, uh, the right hand side minus dt mu will become the total derivative of something. W one can show that it is the total derivative of something if you replace uh, mu by mu t. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, yeah. great. Are there any other questions? If not, then we will give you another go and fog. Any other comments or questions? Okay, so then go ahead with your next question. Wilfried, uh, do you still have a bit of time to stay on for yes, a question? Yes, I have time. 
Okay, yes. excellent. So then, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, um, uh, yes, so my question was about the um, derivative when there is no common noise and that we are writing, we are, we are trying to identify the master equation and you have the derivative in the measure argument. Um, what happens in the in the in the version that I know in the in the theory that I know is that the second derivative the second derivative in a measure argument is actually a derivative in space. Yes. Does the same thing appear here? So. Um, yes. So I so if you go if you go two pages, let, let's see the previous. Uh, go up, go again. Previous page. Yes. So you see. You see there in the middle. Yes. You uh -huh. see that you have uh, all these partial derivatives appearing in uh, the partial Laplacian. Okay, thank you. So you are more familiar with uh, these uh, four expressions. Yes. This uh, right hand side. Yes. And yes. so all I am saying is I am saying that this right hand side has a geometric meaning, it is a partial trace. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. So I have my answers. Um, thank you so much. Great. I, I also have a question. <laughs> I mean, a couple actually, but let me just ask one. So, so you mentioned at the very beginning um, that this theorem from 2019 by Cardia Laguet and De La Rue and so on um, assumes that you have individual noise. Yes. So why is that necessary? And is that also necessary for your version of the theorem? Yes. So with uh, with that individual noise, so individual individual noise give you some smoothing effect, and uh, everything they do, everything we do, fail, go out of the roof if you don't if you don't have individual noise. So what, look at the expression, the, Lap, the this Laplacian expression you see the derivative x x of g mm -hmm. so when you have individual noise uh, this uh, derivative laplacian s s will appear in your equation so this gives you a strong ellipticity property this gives you some ellipticity property which uh, allow you to do some uh, uh, estimate and uh, when you don't have individual noise when you have just a common noise, the last two terms work against you. So if you look at that in Fourier transform, the first two terms behave like a psi one square plus psi two square. And the last two terms behave like an in, inner product of psi one and psi two. Right. So the first term gave you some stronger ellipticity. The last two take away this ellipticity. When you have a common noise together, when you write up psi one square plus psi two square minus two psi one psi two, you get the number of psi one minus psi two square. This can still be zero, even if psi one is not, is not a zero, psi two is not zero. Whereas uh, the term with the, the Laplacian, if you forget the last two terms, it gives you psi one square plus psi two square. And so this gives you a strong uniform ellipticity. So everything we do, we lose, we lose them if uh, we don't have the common noise, we have the individual noise. So the common noise is not good enough. When you have a common noise, you need to add a little bit more to start getting some. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, and then another question, which is more on notation, I think, because that was uh, quite fast, is when you were talking about identifying the gradients, I'm just trying to go back there. Um, so the, you know, the, the gradient in Wasserstein distance, um, well, minus divergence of mu times the gradient of the first variation of a function, Yes. Uh, where where does that relate in this picture? That is not psi, is it? 
So could you re could could you repeat again the question? So if you if you have a function that is defined on p two, so like this function u here. And yes. now you want to identify what is the gradient in the Wasserstein 2 distance of that function. Um, yes. Shouldn't that be uh, minus the divergence of mu times the uh, gradient of the function at that point, mu? Yeah, yes, I see. I see what you are, you, are, you are saying. So when you look at the continuity equation dt rho plus divergence of rho v equal to zero, Mm -hmm. is it the velocity so you are interpreting a rho dot as the gradient and I am interpreting you as the gradient so in in the in the first uh, uh, auto formalis when you look at the dt rho plus divergence of rho v equal to zero auto was interpreting rho dot as uh, the gradient and uh, and uh, uh, some people go that uh, direction. But uh, when uh, Ambrosio, Gigli, and Savary try to make this formalis uh, rigorous, uh, instead of rho dot, they use a v. And so what I call uh, my, the gradient here, if you multiply by a mu and you apply the divergence to it, uh, it will be what you are calling gradient. Ah, OK, but, OK. Okay, yeah, I see right. now. Mm -hmm. So it's identifying yeah. the velocities in RD with the tangent vectors um, if one could take the probability measures as a manifold, but it's not a manifold, so you can't really do that. Yes. Is that right? Yes. yes. So, so, so uh, you will be working with distribution, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, instead of working with a vector field. So is this then the, the gradient of the first variation? Well, that's if you do a gradient yes. descent, right? Then the velocity would be that. Yes. OK. Uh, I see now. Yeah, OK, OK, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, OK. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Good. Um, we have been asking you lots of questions. Oh, I see you unmuted. You have another follow-up question, Lynn Park? Oh no, just maybe, um, uh, I wondered if we could like share the slides if possible or not. Okay, so what what I am going to do, I will make one correction and send the file to Franca mm -hmm. and she can share it with you. In the master equation, I forgot to put the Hamiltonian and yeah. I'm going to put it back before I send it. Thank you so much. Yes, you're welcome. Great, so, so maybe you could just put your email in, in the chat i don't know if that oh you can find my email and send me an email oh yes i can so that do that I'm able to yeah um okay great that was thanks a lot again. of questions yeah edina thank you thanks again thanks for a wonderful yeah, talk yeah. it was a pleasure yeah wonderful talk thank you it was a pleasure so bubaka where are you i am in south africa okay are you with uh are you with a Mark Sedro? Yes, exactly. We, My offices are next to each other. <laughs> okay, you I sent know one what? email that you are giving a talk today. I don't know, but probably you have seen all this. You, you know Mark was my student. Yes, yes, I know. That's why I sent okay. him an email and said, look, uh, okay. your professor is giving a talk. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a bit familiar with Minfield Games, but I learned some new things today as well. So it was actually really nice to have this kind of overview. Um, yeah, for me, it was all learning something new. Absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Indeed, it was. I actually, I'm actually a student of De La Rue. So. Oh, really? Yes. Yes. My name is. Yes. I graduated in 2018. So. I'm I very, see. I'm very Where are you now? Oh, I am in Montreal with uh, the group of Peter Keynes and Ming Yi Wang. Okay, so yes, uh, this is shame, shame. This is a shame. I for the name I was looking for was Kane. Yes. When I said yes. there is a second group of Ken uh, Huang Malhami, and yes. I got to know how I forgot the name. It's not for <laughs> not yes. no worries. So uh, you see, you see Adam Oberman from time to time. Um, no, 
No, I, I don't have the chance to meet him. Are, are you in Magill or you are in... Uh, I'm in Magill. Magill, yes. Adam is also in Magill. I, I didn't have the chance. Oh, I think I see. I, oh, yes, yes, yes. He works on transport equations and yes. I met him maybe one year ago in one of his postdoc um, Laborde. Yes. Oh, yes. David Laborde. Yes, I met him once. I think I see. I remember now. Okay. Yes. Yes, so there should be we should, yes there should be more it, it is good uh, a good idea what uh, frank organized i, I think uh, we should put more energy in exchanging in uh, visiting uh, you are welcome any of you you are welcome to los angeles thank you so uh, it's also right, right right to me if you ever want of course after the pandemic Yes, I agree. <laughs> nice. yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you for this event. It is very, very interesting. Thank you, Franca. And the organizers. Well, I really should uh, thank uh, Bubaka and Idina because they have. I, I've been joining this venture. Idina <laughs> is the guy with the it's, idea. It's really <laughs> <laughs> no, Franca has done a great contribution. So absolutely, okay. absolutely, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, with it, I actually wanted to also ask you a couple of other things, but maybe we can arrange a meeting separately for that. Okay. Give, so you, some, I, give you some general updates. <laughs> when are you coming back to Los Angeles? Um, so at the moment I'm in Bonn and okay. I have the research chair position at Ames Randa uh, part-time. Okay. And uh, I'm planning to go back uh, to Caltech in the end of 2022. Okay. And then start uh, start a tenor track there. Okay. And continue the affiliation with Ames as well. That's already um, arranged with Caltech. Okay. <laughs> all right. It was great to uh, yeah see you all again, and and it was such a pleasure to have you, Wilfried, as a as a guest here. Yes, it was a pleasure. <laughs> okay. okay. Absolutely. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Au revoir, Rin. Au revoir. C'est au sommet. Je t'avais plus en temps là. Oui, oui, je me souviens de toi. Ah oui, Gan mm. euh, Ganette, c'est comment? Oui, oui, ça va bien. Mon prof Olivier m'a parlé de toi. Il dit que vous avez communiqué en temps. Oui, on, on s'est parlé il y a, juste, juste avant que tu ne m'écrives. Donc, euh, oui, c'est très intéressant. Je, je, il m'a dit que tu t'intéresses au jeu à moyen. Et j'ai répondu à ton email, je crois. Oui, oui, oui. oui. Bon, peut-être que, je ne sais pas, euh, comme ils sont en train d'enregistrer le truc ici, là. Je ne ah, sais pas, okay. peut-être on peut, on peut arranger un, 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 un appel et on se cause. Je ne sais pas, quand, ton appel, c'est comment Fais-moi un email, fais-moi un email et on organise ça. Ça marche, ça marche. Ok. D'accord. Bye. Okay. Mm -hmm.